Uh, so our final speaker in this session is Peter Burnhill from uh, Edina. He's the director of Edina, based here in Edinburgh. And he's going to talk about where data and journal content collide. Uh, what does it mean to publish your data? As is often usual, certainly with many speakers and certainly with me, as I've got more slides than I ought to have. Um, so I'm going to be looking as to how I speed up and the rest of it. Um, essentially, uh, what I'm doing here, let me see if I can make this to work, um, is, so the overview of this talk, essentially, is that I have done some data stuff over my career, and I'll give a quick glimpse of this, but... Um, so being a good data person, I've suddenly become, in some sense, a PI come researcher. And, and others are people for compliance and other reasons are telling me to do something with my data. And it's quite salutary, actually, to see what's being said. And so what I'm putting forward here is perhaps three, a categorization of data. So often people are saying, under compliance, you're meant to do this with your data. Well, what are the data that we're talking about? And I'm using two case studies to illustrate that. And there are case studies, I think, which have got general relevance or particular relevance for the community which we're, we are at the moment. So this is the bit about me, so to speak. Um, so I've been in Edinburgh for a long time. This talk about retirement I find uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> this talk about loss of reputation I find uncomfortable, so here I stand before you. So I have been a survey statistician. I've uh, been involved in setting up a data library. I've been a, a, a quantitative methods teacher, um, had some surgeon in GIS, etc. Um, and uh, for a long while, I've uh, been director of Adena, but uh, also had a role in the Digital Curation Centre. So my day job is being Adena, doing lots of stuff, which I won't say about, but you just need to go and enjoy it. So the two case studies, then, are two projects. One is a melon funded project, a two-year project, which we're just coming to the end of. And the other is, if you like, an ongoing project of programmatic activity. Um, where we're particularly interested in uh, doing things on e-journal archiving and finding out about that, and it generates, it's a piece of instrument. So we've got an instrument that generates some data, and I'm reporting on that variously. Um, and they're both about the integrity. So a way of looking at this is the first study is about reference rot, which is this combination of link rot and content drift. Uh, we know about the certain things, and it's a, as I said, it's Mellon Front project, based here at the University of Edinburgh, very much with Herbert von der Sample uh, in Los Alamos, making use of the Memento uh, uh, infrastructure, which allows you to go back and find uh, glimpses of the web that used to occur. Key thing in this is the web has no history. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. What you saw isn't there when you look again, unless somebody does something. So the key thing that with the Memento infrastructure has gone back to find out what has been archived. And that's been part of that particular project. So it's a, it's a software edifice behind that piece of infrastructure. Um, so the key thing in reference rot we know about is the link rot. That happens all the time. But increasingly what we've got to recognize is that the content at the end of a URI, even if it's not broken, changes over time. Either because it's dynamic, it said sun and now it says rain, but something more for, important than that. Or the same URI now points to something radically different. And so here's an example of... Ford, which was a, a digital library thing in 2000, and now it's completely something completely different. So this is actually really fundamental. So that, that what we will be talking about is the scholarly literature, but it's got much, much more importance when we talk about web resident content, which of course is where we're all going, with all the links to data and all to the other things. So hold in your head that, hey, looks bad over here, but hey, we haven't thought about it for the stuff that we're now talking about. So in this, the findings, um, we'll go through some of this. I've got some glimpses. We looked at four big corpus of data. One was 7,000 e-theses we downloaded and extracted hundreds of thousands of ERI, uh, URI, uh, URIs out of that. Um, also, three very large corpuses of um, journal articles, which I'll make some reference to. Um, and in particular, what we've got to recognize is that increasingly people are making references to the web at large. Making references back into the scholarly record, yes, we know about that. That used to be on the shelf along the other thing when you got out of that other journal and you looked at the article or you had to wait for you know, interlibrary loan, etc. And then it became very easy to click, click. But increasingly, we're making references to things what you are, uh, are on there. The New York Times, for example, is quoted and cited more often by American sociologists than the top sociology journals. It's a source of evidence. It's not just entertainment. It's actually where the evidence is. Um, and here we've got three, four major corporate, three reported there. One is an archive, the total, a lot of contents of archive for 10 years was analysed. 
uh, from PubMed Central been referred to, downloaded those been referred to, and we had a sample from Elsevier. That's right, so Elsevier were cooperating with there, and you can see the references out there. It's significant the main references there. So the PubMed, com uh, 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 PubMed Central corpus, 20% are rotten. If you imagine a two by two table, is it live on the web? Is it not live on the web? Do we find anything in an archive? And we looked at the six principal archives, Internet Archive, Archive Today, the Web Archive from the British Library, etc. Is it in the archive? Is it not in the archive? Nice little two by two table. Bottom right hand corner, I mean, it's not live and it's not there. It gone. 20% gone, PubMed Central. Elsevier, a third gone. These are references in articles. So we've got this idea, a nice idea of fixity. This is a nice tidy world, remember, that we believe, more than the exciting world we're going to, where these dependencies are all the more. In that nice little tidy world, our scholarly record is essentially deficient. Right? Got to do something about it. But now I shouldn't be talking about this because I'm talking about dealing with data. So how do we get on? Um, so we've got some answers in this project all right so we've done some soft we've done some thinking actually in this two years we're thinking actually how is it these references are generated so we've got some three four workflows you know one is in the preparation during the authoring stage that's obviously the best time when people are looking at the web seeing something very really important that's the moment maybe is the best to capture it so Mendeley in the house EndNote in the house reference manager in the house this is algorithm that you want in your software to be able to capture the reference, make sure there is a snapshot, put in an archive, bring back the URI. We've got some of this formulation stuff. We've been using Zotero, downloading Zotero, or using the, opera, uh, using the open source, because open source matters here, because we can think and do prototypes using open source, demonstrate it in an open source product so that the reach potentially of all the Mendeley's, EndNote, End Reference Manager, Ref me, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can make use of this. Obviously, the submission systems, that's quite important. Any publishers in the house running property? Because what happens is when we do what we need to do to refer to the URIs, the publications, are, the process systems throw them all away. Get rid of this because that's non standard. So we've actually got some publications that we attempted to do where we attempted to do the right thing, and even for PLOS, they threw away all the good references because they couldn't handle it. So we've got to have a way of doing with that. And similarly, things that are on the, uh, 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 the frontages, and so it's not just the frontages of Elsevier, Science Director, etc. It's also the frontages in the stuff that we've been talking about, the URIs that are there, they don't lead to anywhere necessarily. So because researchers use as a driven people, sometimes they ignore that, they just drive on. But actually, we're all selling rotten goods. So there's prototyping going on. So that's the project. That's an example of a project that's generating data to do the analysis, generating some software. And here's just an example of the Zotero plugin and just an advert for that, I suppose, as to what's going on. So the other one is e-journal archiving. Okay? It's online. Ease of access is fantastic. Any day, any time. We can all do that. But actually, it ain't in the library anymore, is it? Libraries are boasting of e-collections, but hey, they're just e-connections. Uh, they ain't there. Not just the journal articles aren't there, but also the newspapers aren't there, the government documents aren't there, all the things you thought a library was about aren't there. Okay, so digital shelves. So we've been looking about this in the Keeper's Registry, and this uses the device of the ISSN looking as a stream of content which now is not just a stream of content of things that have in parts, but things that change over time. You can assign ISSNs to integrating resources, continuing resources. And so it's a way of looking at what are those waterfalls of content that are coming from different places. Um, we've, we've worked on a thing called the Keeper's Registry, and that monitors what the archiving agencies are reporting they're doing, the clocks in the portico, the British Library, Library of Congress, etc. They report in against the ISSN register, and they say, we're looking after this. And by subtraction, we can find out who's what's not being looked at. And so we got some empirical findings, and they're not too clever. Two-thirds of what was consulted online in, in the UK in 2012 is at risk of loss. We don't know that anybody's looking at it. And we've also looked at the title lists of some major university libraries. And so the fact is that we don't know. Maybe it is being done, but actually we're talking to the 10 
principal archiving agency. So again, we've got a monitor, we've got a telescope onto this activity, and we've got two very key indicators, all right? Ingest ratio, in other words, you know, the number being looked after divided by the potential number of ISSNs we've now been assessed and, uh, to, uh, assigned to ISSN uh, to, to serials. Um, and a keep safe ratio which says that we understand there's three or more. Because of course you can't trust one because it might go down. Um, but there the numbers aren't very, they're a bit worried aren't they really? Um, so similarly we looked at the open URL requests that flow through a DINA uh, through the OpenUR router and then go on to the OpenUR resolvers and then result in happiness, etc., etc. So we've got there 8.5 million requests coming through to us and so we've aggregated those up to the 53,000 or so online resources that were being consulted and then we check those against the um, uh, Keeper's Registry. Again, using this as data to check this up. So a third are being ingested by at least one. Two-thirds we don't know. We did this again in 2015, and it's improved, partly because we know about more archiving agencies, maybe because they are being archived. So we've got a monitor. This is good improvement. But still, it's not that clever. So the, so the results are here. I'm, so partly, I'm trying to tell you about the bad news, the good news about these results, these data, which you should worry about, and I'd like you to act on it. But partly, these are two projects that we're doing. We're generating data. We're generating software. So we actually also did very, very recently looked at the ISSNs that have been signed by country. And um, so the ingest ratio, the keep surf ratio. So actually, in the Netherlands, why is that good? Because Elsevier is good. Did I say that? <laughs> I did. Elsevier is good in the sense that they've stepped up and they've made sure that their content is being kept by KB, the Dutch National Library, by Clocks, and by Portico. And they're paying for those last two. So this is good. And this is true of other commercial publishers, that they're doing the right thing. Um, and that's true in the States and the UK. So not entirely good, not everybody's good, and maybe they themselves are not as good as they should be because they're not all of their content. But nevertheless, that's what we want. Um, and in the DOAJ index, they're being good in the sense that they're saying not only do you have to get as an open access journal going at ISSN, but also make sure that you're being archived by Clocks or Portico or something uh, more regular like that. So there are some good things happening in this, but we need to know how far progress we're making. So again, we've got this instrument called the Keeper's Registry, which is monitoring that. There is a problem. There is a big dinosaur in the room. Forget about elephants. And this one has a very long tail. So we've got the big publishers doing some stuff, which is good, but we've got all of those other things which are important to us, or we believe they're important to us, which are not sufficiently being done. So we need a strategy you know, it's an action program, one vertebrae at a time to work out what we need to do, etc. But again, this is just a project. Well, it's more than a project, it's an action plan. But we're generating data on this, we're doing some analysis, but we're generating data on code. So going back to something I wrote earlier, which was looking at the flow of publications from funded research activity, quite a while earlier as it happened, what's interesting about this compliance business is that the, 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 the funders are put in money and they want to get out publications. It's a very simple sort of measure, right? That's their impact, you know. We put in 50,000 pounds and we got lots of stuff. And it's a nice simplicity. But as we know, behind that is something else. It's a richer picture, yeah? And the richer picture says that we've got research projects. We've got projects, projects of things, where it's got some leadership of a PI, other researchers give their lives and other things to doing this activity. And actually what's interesting is we gain then a workflow of work in progress. Now this is focusing on the journal article or the article. Um, we did at that time when writing this paper also be aware of other things and you'll find it in the paper we talk about um, articles being like, cr uh, like uh, crates of goodness. They report findings, they are not research. I mean when we get this idea that publications are not themselves research. It's very good that that's now generally being said. But what we've also got to recognize is inside that workflow, data <coughs> essentially are working capital and references to other roads are working capital in, in the process of doing the research and in writing up your work in progress. And you, you know, it's around the study and thing you're doing. So the question is, to some extent, you're doing that as a project activity. 
Um, and the question is, to some extent, when does that get out for others to see? So the open science idea is how far I'd be doing this so that other people can see what I'm doing. And that obviously is a big shift, that we're not just huddling around one telescope, but we're sharing that. Although here we have got a telescope. Um, a new sort of telescope. So we can think of, therefore, uh, of data as working capital. We can think, perhaps, as data as results to be shared. So there's two different ways of thinking about these data. And five, gosh, pick up speed. So the idea was to say what data should we be sharing. You know, a problem for us, but a problem for everyone. What is the data? Is it the data where I went and got it from, nearer to the instrument? So the big the data factory that's been referred to. You know, that's where, in some sense, I should cite that, perhaps. But, or is it the data behind the graph? And again, it's a richness. It's my findings, my extending findings. It's not just the spreadsheet, but it's a larger sort of thing as part of my general statement. Or is it, in some sense, this guddle of stuff I have in the middle where I'm assembling data sets, reworking them, revising them, coming up with derived variables, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we certainly should cite where the data originates, how it came about. Because if you don't know how it came about, it's just a bunch of numbers. It ain't really a sample, it's just a batch of stuff. Um, we obviously need to make sure we understand what is the multi-part work. That we're, you know, so it's not just a simple statement in terms of a bunch of words or a pretty picture that impresses. It's got to be something else. So what is the something else, the richness? And then we've got to really work hard, I think, to find out what it is that a scientist, a researcher, a scholar, an academic should genuinely be sharing and what it is is just my working capital, because I'm allowed some private space to think. I don't know every time I do something, somebody's going over my shoulder and either nicking it or thinking, well, that was stupid, because I'm allowed to be stupid. That's what being a researcher is about. Um, so to some extent, looking at my two projects there, we've got some data, these 7,000 doctoral theses that we downloaded. Hey, they're open, so that's fine. We extracted the URIs. I say we did. Well, I didn't, but somebody much cleverer than me did and that's quite a hard piece of work from Language Technology Group. And then we went off and we um, uh, found using the Memento technology to be able to find out whether they're on the web live or whether they're in the archives, etc. And so all of that is data, so we make that available now. Um, and what's the cost of us doing that? Because actually we also think there's an action plan. We think we've got to go in and do some real stuff because actually something rotten is in the state of, not Denmark, let it off the hook. Um, so, and then the type B data, then, is all of this other stuff that we've assembled, which actually is underneath the statements that we've been making, which do the pretty graphs that we can put up. So what is it we should be sharing? But actually, sh what should we look about this web resident research statements that people are now talking about, that our statements uh, pre pre preceding speakers, and no doubt all, we'll be talking about things that are web resident and I'll have huge dependence on those URIs. And in some sense, we're saying the statement is not just a simple statement or the data, but all the other dependencies. So how we can somehow be assured. So we've got to have strategy for seeing it, acting, archiving it, making sure the URI points to the right thing, etc. cetera. Um, so here's a nice thing from Mike Parsons. Uh, only, uh, only 10 years ago, telling us we should be doing the right thing. That's grand. It's a quite a nice little statement, actually, back in um, 1897, uh, which is, a scholar's positive contribution is measured by the sum of the original data that he contributes, she, probably, anyway, but uh, forgive him. Uh, hypotheses come and go, but data remain. I mean, that's pretty strong. So the idea that we didn't know, it's not necessarily we have to change our science, we have to remember what it is, because we've been doing it before. So some practical questions about when should we do it. So, you know, our data equals finding. This is that part and parcel of that. So going back to this diagram, what we have to recognize is that in this activity, which does take time, if we leave it to the point in which we publish to make the data available, we've forgotten where it is. In the documentation that you then have to write, you've forgotten what it was you did. So there's somewhere in here says that the workflow activity 
you know, whether it's committing your code into GitHub at the time you use that as tool, whether it's using Figshare, whether it's using your, you know, your data share repository or whatever it is in your institution, it needs to be there because actually we're all humans. We, you know, that is to say, if we leave it to the point of publication because it's required by an editor, it's actually far, far too late, far, far, far too late. Um, so the idea is start early, maybe with documentation, and using embargo not as a bad word, but embargo is a good word, that is to say, save the bits, make sure it's put somewhere, properly documented, with, a, with you being in control. Um, so, I decided I needed to learn, so colleagues I've been working with before, uh, Data Library got them to help me as a PI, even though I meant to know, because of course you don't. So, a um, colleague of mine did this, uh, looking at this, how you move data from your thumb drive, from your personal space, from your OneDrive now these days. Move it from that up into something institutionally kept. Um, so we have data share here in Edinburgh. Um, and that was just indicating this business about web residence. But that, that slide itself is a whole debate about what constitutes fixity, given that the real attraction of digital is that it's malleable. And if we're about recordness, then we need to enjoy fixity somehow. We need to have some sense about what that's about. And therefore, version control and how you go back to the right version. So you know, techniques like the time travel in, in, in Memento are important to recognize. And that's another way of, sort of an agenda of saying, how do we push this up and it's moving it into the area of data publishing, if indeed that's the right phrase and word. Um, and we moved on that. So otherwise, I thank you and uh, your indulgence. Thank you. you and coffee now, isn't it? It all satisfied. I hope you're not satisfied. I hope you're <laughs> fundamentally dissatisfied, but I'll take that as shell shock. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>